nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So, good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are, or good night. Um, so, my name is Gerhard. And what I'd like to start out uh, with is give you a brief overview of NanoHub, what it's about, uh, and then I'll dive into ChipsHub, and then as announced into Abacus and Crystal Viewer. So here is a, the home screen of uh, NanoHub. So we're all about modeling and simulation. We expanded into data from experiments as well. We want to enable people to learn and teach. Uh, we have developers on the site that uh, develop tools and scripts, and then ultimately we enable them to share and publish them so that you can actually duplicate scientific results or data or enable others to use um, your tools or your ideas in classrooms, uh, ideas in classrooms or in research. So um, these are the main themes and we have apps we have a, a lot of courses. There's actually over 170 courses on NanoHub, and there's a whole software development environment, and there's a publishing environment. On the homepage, we feature a couple of uh, different items. Obviously, semiconductor workforce development is a big deal, and uh, we have some of uh, that uh, semiconductor work workforce development also encapsulated in ChipsHub. So you can type chipshub.org which will take you actually into a group page on NanoHub. So here is our uh, uh, relatively recently created Chips Hub uh, page. And it's structured similarly to the front page, but uh, now it's really focusing on semiconductor education and chip um, um, tape out and uh, tools for chip design and understanding devices. So I uh, I usually actually start from the right side when I describe it. I mentioned to you we have a, a whole bunch of open courses, open courseware courses, and we are featuring a couple here. Uh, if you would open this with a new window, there's uh, courses on semiconductor fundamentals and nanotransistors, and uh, a general course on semiconductors. This is what I use for teaching uh, at the grad level. Uh, then Supriyo Data has a couple of uh, very beautiful courses on, on quantum transport and transport at the nanoscale. And then uh, we have biosensors, uh, atomic force, uh, um, AFM uh, course, um, physics in computers where uh, Supriyo is connecting to different computing paradigms, thermal uh, work and reliability, design of experiments. So the, there's many courses here on ChipSub that are dedicated to, to elements of, of device process and chip design. Um, Mark Lensom also started an initiative on free textbooks where some of these courses have now uh, textbooks associated with them. So Suprio is here uh, with several books. Mark Lundstrom has Fundamentals of Nanotransistors, um, Thermal Transport, so, so a variety of free books that can be downloaded. Um, and uh, so one of the key elements uh, needed for, for chip design is uh, access to uh, high-end um, design tools. So uh, uh, we uh, have installed the Silvaco tool suite. That's a commercial tool set uh, from Silvaco. And we're in the process of installing Synopsys, Cadence uh, tools that are commercial tools, and op also the open source uh, design pipelines. So if I click here with a right click on the Silvaco tool, I get to uh, uh, the Silvaco TCAD. And as I launch this, and I'm logged in already, you actually get access to the full TCAD suite, and it's dedicated to educational use. So this is not for commercial use. There's a license agreement here that pops up, and it launches the, uh, the full uh, Silvaco TCAD uh, tool suite. And um, so that's uh, uh, the set of commercial tools. We have a couple of tools that are semi-commercial. Uh, the Padre and Profit uh, came from Bell Labs. So these were tools that actually do did design transistors. And we have SPICE, and we have molecular dynamics tools that are community tools, and a couple of more. Uh, what I really want to focus on is the more immersive learning part. 
um, uh, where we have tools and apps. And I draw the distinction between a tool and an app in the sense that a, a tool might look like this, where you might have to get a driver's license first, so to speak, quite some training to use this tool uh, versus um, uh, a tool like this, where we look at um, an app that is encapsulating full-fledged tools, but in an app form. So we actually created apps um, two years before they came out in iPhones, and we embedded complex tools into simple user interfaces. And this Abacus toolset is really a, a, a set of apps that are combined for teaching semiconductors. So if you're teaching a, a typical semiconductor course, you probably start from crystals, then you probably introduce some band models. You might deal with some bulk semiconductors where you shine light on it, et cetera. You'll probably cover a PN junction. Many courses still cover bipolar junction transistors. Some others don't anymore, but it's in the tool set. Then you touch uh, MOS capacitors and you probably end up at MOSFETs. Uh, in some shape or form, you typically teach these kind of um, this kind of content in a fundamental semiconductor course. So uh, here you see animations that are taken from the Abacus toolset. And uh, in this uh, overview page, which is really a wiki or group page, you can dive into. So here we have these crystals and we highlight the tools in there. Here's band structure models that will be part of uh, the next uh, recitation where you uh, we have a nice model where you can actually derive band structure from tra transmission in multiple barriers where if you add atoms to your system, so to speak, you can see band structure emerging really naturally. If you like the typical chronic penny model, we of course have that as well. And you can, you can look at that. And if you want to look at nanoscale band structures of nanowires or bulk, real bulk semiconductors, you can do that as well in band structure lab. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, bulk semiconductors, you probably need to teach a Fermi function and maybe shining light on a on a transistor uh, on a chunk of semiconductor that's included here. Uh, the next step, as I mentioned, is uh, PN junctions. So there's a variety of demo and teaching materials that are associated with each of these items. Then BJTs, similar. We have exercises and an overview. MOS capacitors are next with some exercises. And at the end, you typically end up on MOSFETs like this. And all along, you can say, OK, I want to run this tool set. So you click on this. And what it will do is well, it will literally just launch this session. If you're logged in, it'll just launch it for you. If uh, you're not logged in, it'll prompt you for a login. And you can log in with uh, uh, your university credentials. Typically, so you can register uh, with, say, Stanford.edu or whatever university you're, you're affiliated with. Uh, or you can use your Google uh, login, or you can create a NanoHub login. Either way, um, from where can we get this abacus? So, so let me show you how I got there. So I'm going to go to chipshub.org. Um, so the easiest way is if you go into semiconductor device fundamentals, and that's the Abacus page. And from here, you can launch the tool. Um, you can also just bookmark groups slash Abacus. All right, so here I launched this tool. Uh, I'm on a big screen, so I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So you can drag uh, this uh, session, uh, make it a little bit bigger. So this is the splash screen of Abacus. And uh, as I said, it's really a, a, almost like a, a, a tool of apps or a container of different apps. So today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, crystals. And I've highlighted some of the outputs that you can get with the other tools in the group page already. So today, I'm just going to look at uh, the Crystal Viewer Lab. And if I launch it in here, this one is the newer version, which uh, looks kind of snazzy. Um, it, it takes a minute to build up. Um, and I have put, of course, one like in any good cooking show, I put one in the oven already. So here it comes up uh, with uh, 
the crystal viewer per se, and we're looking at materials. So here you have a standard silicon uh, textbook unit cell that you might find in a textbook, sort of in a in a cubic representation. You can rotate it around, um, you can play with it. You can use different materials like germanium, and I'll highlight some of the other materials that we have here on the top. Uh, you can highlight the minimal basis that you find in a textbook, which is just this one, or you can have the repeated basis sort of in a, um, in a representation like that, where you s sort of see how a unit cell can be constructed. And what I have students do is I have them play with a textbook basis um, to identify some symmetries. But what's really interesting is to go into a bigger crystal and it's constructing it right now. So here is your silicon crystal. What I have students in my uh, class do is I tell them, okay, rotate this into the uh, 100 crystal direction and take a screenshot. So it kind of resembles of when I learned crystals where the faculty member would drag in a stick and um, ball and stick model and hand it to people in the first row, begging people not to break it. So then you can rotate it also in the uh, 110 crystal direction here, have them take screenshots and see how the symmetry is very different. And um, maybe the, the 110 uh, crystal direction like this. You can put in uh, middle planes. So you can put in, for example, a, a 111 plane and it'll cut here. It takes a second to build in. So here's the, mir uh, the Miller plane in 111. You can slice this uh, uh, plane at different uh, distances, and you can have students count, uh, say, the bonds that are going through a particular plane um, uh, to look at uh, the react reactivity or the surface uh, defect density that you might want to calculate. Um, it also helps them to visualize what are these planes and how are they laid out. Uh, they can play with it. Um, you can uh, put in these, these pre-configured ones can put in and we've got one sort of odd one one to one in here to get people an idea how you else you can construct it cutting through multiple crystal planes that are not the natural cuts and again you can uh, play with it you can change the how big you want to make the cell so you can click on configuration and change say uh, how big you want to make this box etc um, so there's germanium as well, but that basically just uh, changes the color of the balls. Uh, we have zinc blended materials. So the typical ones here are, say, gallium arsenide. And, and here is your textbook basis of gallium arsenide. And they're, they're sort of color coded by, by different atoms. So if you go into um, aluminum arsenide, um, Basically, the arsenic stays the same and the aluminum changed colors a little bit. Um, but the crystal structure remains the same now. You can get the crystal again and and see how uh, uh, various plane uh, planes aligns. You can look at stacking orders, etc. So this takes a couple of seconds to build. And so here you can look at uh, similar to what you had with silicon, but now you can see different stacking orders as well uh, of these atoms, say, in the in the growth to, typical growth direction of 100. And if you look at diagonal, then you see quite, quite different things. And again, you can turn on the Miller planes uh, to examine the material. And you have the typical materials. And again, in a practical sense, all you're changing here is the colors of these atoms. Uh, in the older tool, which I also want to demonstrate, you can actually sort of visualize the relative size of these atoms. So we have vortite here, so typically gallium nitride, and it's assembling the, the bigger cell, right? So here's the, the hexagonal uh, structure, um, and it's in the, in, uh, in the, again, probably three unit cells in all directions. And here is the textbook basis again, for, for the hexagonal structure like this. Um, what else do we have here? So we have uh, a rock salt, right? Sodium chloride is, is another one. Here's an example of, um, uh, of um, 
center cubic type structure, cesium chloride, um, and a couple of other materials. And at the tail end, we have graphene, uh, well, here, 2D material, MOS2, um, a, a 2D material to visualize that as well. Um, also, you might be teaching in your, well, let me, let me go into the older uh, crystal viewer. So here is um, the, basically the same functionality of a tool, but it's uh, using um, the, the original uh, crystal viewer tool. It has some capabilities that are interesting as well. So here you can sort of have uh, in a, uh, a structure, and I believe this is uh, indium nitride, uh, you can have a sort of a relative um, a description of uh, atom sizes. And uh, if you want to talk about strain effects and other things, if you insert different materials. So that might be another view that could be interesting. But overall, the tool is basically the same. It just is in, in an older interface that um, that we used to call rapture um, and we're starting to migrate from these these older looking unix based interfaces to the more modern uh, web form and actually what this is here is it's a jupyter notebook running uh, in your browser in an app form um, so you might be uh, teaching also uh, uh, bravi lattices in your course so we have the typical uh, textbook bases um, uh, that you that you encounter so typical cubic and here's body centered cubic and face centered cubic so these are the typical unit cells you you explore um, you have a basis representation and then you have an can again visualize a, a larger crystal here we go and um, so here is the the bigger unit cell of face centered cubic um, like this um and then of course the other triclinic is there um the monoclinic structures and uh, orthorhombic uh, tetragonal and then hexagonal and then uh, tri 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 uh trigonal uh, trigonal uh basis set so so the typical uh bravi lattices uh, all of them are here in the in the tool and again you can uh put in planes uh, like this, and and teach even this in the simple structure. What are the different planes that uh, that you might want to look at? So so if you're covering Bravi uh, lattices in your course, so this is one way of exploring them and sending students off to to count atoms, nearest neighbor atoms, and have them dump out uh, screenshots. So um, so. For example, speaking of which, if you want to get a screenshot of this, you can uh, click on this button here, download a plot as a PNG. And if I click on that, it just um, created this PNG file and it downloaded it into my download uh, um, box. Um, um, similar in the, in the older tools, the Abacus tools, um, all of them, when you're in the simulate at the end, there's a little download button here next to the various outputs. So again, here you had the textbook cell. Um, if you like it, you can download it as an image file or as a VTK file. In other tools where there might be lines and curves, there's other output formats you can choose. But in any of these things, you can basically download uh, your final product, so to speak. You can, uh, right, you can zoom into these uh, objects uh, if you want, and, and rotate it into a direction that you like, uh, you can go in here and um, change, uh, again, similar, the, the, the relative um, atom scale, and you can turn on and off the bonds and, and do your adjustment to the plot that you like. And if you like what you see, then you can download it and it, it's safe. And um, so here, it, Here's the magic. It pops up a little browser in a browser, and you can save the file in your in your directory, and and drag it into your into your Word file or your instructional set, etc. Or your students can do the same thing in their homework assignments. 
Um, so, so that's sort of what I wanted to cover for for Crystal Viewer slash Abacus slash Overview of Chipsub. And I, I wasn't planning to do death by PowerPoint uh, and show you a ton of PowerPoint slides on impact, et cetera. So I, I'd like to open the floor and actually um, have you um, ask questions on what can be done or what our experience here is. Um, that makes it a little bit more lively than, than death by PowerPoint. So I, I'd, I'd invite you to maybe ask questions or comment, please. The first question, is it possible to view, say, a 111 slice of the crystal? A 111 site? Slice? Slice. Ah. Um, we used to have a version that would chip off part of the crystal. Um, let me go in here. So in the old tool, let's go to, uh, say, Zinc Blender. Uh, gallium arsenide, larger cell. And so it just runs this right now. And it should actually peel out a, a cached simulation. Oh, it's that one is interestingly not cached. Okay, tool must have gotten updated. So under the hood, we actually construct these crystals with the Nemo software that came out of my research group. Uh, this is shifted. Let me be clear. Yeah, in the in the older tool, it it sometimes uh, shifts the origin once you messed around with it. So you're asking, can you look at a structure like this? I'm gonna crank up the atoms a little bit bigger. So gallium arsenide, they're pretty much the same. Uh, the same site and oh I see yeah, in, in the old tools you have to turn on Miller planes so you have to go into settings and say draw Miller planes and you ask for one 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 that's so correct there you can get that And it's constructing it right now. And in the in the more modern tool, you can just go to uh, to say uh, gallium arsenide here. Uh, look at the textbook base. and look at the crystal. And here you can have a one 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 crystal direction just by clicking here. And it's constructing the model right now. So give it a second. And hopefully, where did I leave this off? Okay, so here now you should see. Oh, yeah, so here you can actually see um, where it got sliced. So the older version of the tool, you can kind of see a slice and it chops off the crystal. And uh, you can see the flip side. So here is the, the sliced version. So you can see a, bit, a little bit nicer. Um, the atoms that are actually on that surface. Uh, the newer tool allows you to slice uh, with a sort of a, uh, with this, uh, this slicer here. So you can uh, look at it this way and it, you can dynamically shift this plane around, but we don't have it yet where it takes away part of the crystal. So you can kind of look at the slice with part of the crystal taken away. So, so it's still, uh, I would say, some work in progress on, on the newer tool. All right, great. Uh, the next question, is it possible to add metal structures, for example, to create plasmons? So in the old tool, uh, I believe, There's a function to create your own crystal. And um, you can basically construct your own crystal structure 
from uh, with Bravi vectors and uh, um, etc. Unit cells etc. So you can construct your own material. There's not a say uh, an import function where you can say import a from from a database a, a crystal structure. We don't have that. But here you can change how many um, uh, basis uh, sets you like to have. And so, so you can construct your own crystal. It's pretty advanced uh, usage. I probably wouldn't want to use it in a classroom. Um, and to simulate plasmons, that's yet another uh, calculation on top, right? This is. Uh, it would be a sort of an electronic structure calculation plus some um, perturbations on top. That this tool here, Crystal Viewer, is literally just that. Think of your, if you are as old as me, think of your faculty member walking in with a ball and stick model. Um, that's what this tool is meant to be: a simple access uh, to uh, the crystal structures. All right, great. I think you answered. Uh, a few of the other questions with that. Someone asked if you could give a preview of the upcoming sessions where you'll be discussing the other capabilities of Abacus. Sure. Is that um, sort of a summative question or is there something more specific to Crystal Viewer next before I go back and kind of hit the rewind button? Uh, okay. Well, maybe you can say, I'm not sure if your last answer answered these, but um, people are asking about specific structures, it looks like, in the chat. So, for example, someone asked about a CSSNL3 structure. Um, yeah, if, it's not, if it's not in the list blatantly right now, um, we don't have it. But in principle, we could be adding those kind of materials. Um, you can go into the So each tool actually has a, uh, so if I go here, for example, uh, tools, abacus. So, um, so there are uh, wishes you can put in or questions and uh, we can add more crystal structures, right? So, so you can see there's sort of some stats that 19,000 people used it. Uh, it's been cited in the literature. There's some questions, there's reviews, and there's wishes. So uh, this would be a good place to add these things, these requests. If you see something missing, right? There's another question. Can we form a MOIR pattern and check the band gap? Um, so. Uh, Again, a, a more pattern uh, could be generated in this tool. The tool is capable enough. I mean, the Nemo, with the Nemo software that we are working on, uh, we have looked at um, double layer um, or 2D materials and more patterns, and we can calculate band gaps kind of things. But this is uh, beyond the scope of what this specific tool does, right? That's more a, a research question and we can engage in that uh, research type discussion. Um, again, this, this crystal viewer is literally just that. It doesn't calculate uh, band structure right now. We have a band structure tool that can calculate a variety of materials, and I'm planning to demonstrate that uh, in one of the, the lectures. So maybe now is a good time I can go back to um, uh, what am I going to show in the next session. So. So if I go to chipshub.org, it actually redirects me to, to the group in, in NanoHub. And we're talking about semiconductor device fundamentals. That's what this recitation is about. And uh, so I will be covering in the next recitations these items here. So today I've mostly talked about sort of static structure. Where do atoms sit? And then I'll go over these models. And this is sort of the splash screen so uh, the next item will be band models and uh, band structure. And um, these are the screenshots taken from the tools we have on NanoHub uh, in, uh, that are sitting in Abacus. Um, so 
everybody knows, of course, uh, about periodic potentials. So that's the chronic penalty model. That's a standard method of teaching how do band gaps emerge, etc. And I'll be covering that. Uh, personally, I prefer uh, to introduce band structure in a different way in my class. What I actually do is I, I introduce tunneling through a single barrier and a double barrier where you can calculate things analytically. And then we have a tool where um, it can calculate for you tunneling through many barriers. And you start out, say, with one or two barriers, and you get these transmissions. But as you make more and more barriers, it's very clear that bands are uh, connecting or forming. This is very much um, alike to a band pass filter. I have electrical engineering grad students that um, that relate to bandpass filters. And to me, it's a much more natural way to address band structure. Uh, and of course, we can calcul calculate band structure in real materials and band structure lab with silicon, where you can then form it into just as in bulk or in, two, um, in an ultra thin body or a nano wire. And I'll cover that as well uh, in one of the recitations. Then, uh, in another recitation, we're going to deal with just simple drift diffusion lab, where you can do experiments of shining light at an end of a semiconductor and see the, the charge distribution in, in the semiconductor, or shine light on top and see how the distribution uh, of carriers looks like. And that, under the hood, is actually running a real semiconductor device tool that we got from Bell Labs uh, years ago. Uh, another coverage is PN junctions. Uh, so also that app runs um, Padre, the, the Bell Labs tool, but you can really have students play with um, um, different dopings. They can play with uh, band edge diagrams and ramp up voltages and see how the bands move and look at the internal properties like charge distributions. Um, all right. All right, um, so PN junctions, and we have an older version and a newer version uh, for this, because this is probably the most popular tool in Nano, PN Junction Lab. Uh, I'll cover uh, bipolar junction transistors as well, where you can uh, simulate them for real um, with all kinds of non-ideal effects as well. Uh, I'll cover MOS capacitors. And again, we have an app here wrapped around Padre where you can have a typical um, MOS capacitor and you can run it in high and in low frequency. You can look at uh, N-type and P-type. Uh, you can look at actually also double gate devices. Um, and ultimately, here is uh, one of the MOSFET tools we have on NanoHub in Abacus. Um, what I do in my class there, I have students um, configure this uh, this traditional 2D uh, transistor and see what happens as you uh, make the channel shorter and shorter. And in fact, in my course, I, I, I killed exams and I replaced them by projects, by group projects, where one project deals with a, a quantum dot photo detector and another project deals with uh, designing a nano transistor a nano wire tra a transistor, in fact, and and those projects run for two or three weeks, and they use multiple tools uh, to do so. And so, in, in Abacus, we have the the traditional uh, uh, classical MOSFET, and you can do a anti-P type uh, dual gates as well. So, so those are the various tools I'm planning to cover in the in the next sessions. So that's the rapid fire overview. And in all of this, we sort of have a, a faculty only page um, where we can share homework assignments and solutions, et cetera. And that's in the process of building it up still. So, so we have some of that available. I hope that helps. And uh, by the way, the we've done this recitation series with some 400, 500 faculty members in the past and we have recorded them. So um, so on this abacus page, group slash groups abacus, 
you can see the recordings of the previous sessions. So you can look ahead, come prepared with questions, or if you can't make the uh, meeting, um, that's that's fine. Right. We did have a few more questions come in. Sure. Someone asked, can I draw a plane on the structure and the tool returns the Miller indices of it? No, no, we don't have that yet. That, okay. That's a really cool, uh, a very cool idea. All right, uh, someone asked um, if the crystal structure can be downloaded as an STL file for a 3D printer. Ooh, <laughs> wow, uh, I haven't heard that. Uh, it can be downloaded, but not as an STL file, I believe. Um, and I'm stumped in what, so it certainly would be in the older tool, which is still a bit more powerful. Let me find it here. So we got this guy here simulate and we have a result here i don't know i know we can download um position files but they might be in xyz uh, let's just see what it comes back with all right so uh so there's a vtk data file which has um that so not not certainly not a 3d printer file but that would be an interesting expansion right that one could could put in all right i think yes you can I, i'm i see the chat now i was able to find okay. the, the pop out uh yeah actually let me show you that feature everybody can actually create um nano hub Oops. Um, if you just go there, you can create a new group. Okay? So it pops up. I was invited to a couple of groups here. Apparently, I haven't been to that page for a while. And you can create your own group. You have to give it an ID, a title, some tags, and a public description, a private description. And then there is, uh, you it can be open to anybody. It could be restricted maybe to your class or by invitation only. Uh, and membership cannot be requested, which is um, you basically have to invite people uh, privately. But so, so, so you can create your own group and it can have uh, various features, right? So um, let's see. For example, I have my own uh, group page here with members and a bunch of things that are available on the left. So I use that in my own, on my own research and interactions with students. Um, there's other groups, in fact, that look very different, like ChipSub is a group which you can configure very easily. So so you can make uh, groups easily, uh, plain vanilla. And if you want to make them a bit more complicated, you need a bit more interaction. Uh, but in principle, yeah, anybody can uh, create a group and invite people, etc. All right, someone asked, are there applications or tools that show orbitals? Um, yes. Um, my favorite tool is that shows orbitals is Nanohub Tools Q dot Quantum dot Lab, where um, without running it, so you can you can make pyramidal dots and look at orbitals of artificial atoms. Uh, but there is more um, if you go Nanohub. And simulation powered curriculum. There are tools in general chemistry. Uh, and I believe there there's a tool set no freshman chemistry. Yeah, there's there's tools in here where you can visualize 
uh, orbitals and um, electronic structure orbitals. But let me see, I'm actually looking for. All right, so, so here is a uh, orbital visualization. Here you go, here's your water. Oh, so here I saw this question and Tanya referred to this uh, person. Um, so when people contribute to NanoHub, um, we, we provide them also with impact statements, how many people have used their tools, etc. So, and then the person can get, so this person has served over 7,000 people uh, with simulation tools and roughly, you know, 80 people ballpark each month use this tool. So any, any contributor on NanoHub has a, a homepage like that. Works well for writing proposals, et cetera, to tell people that you are actually having an outreach program. All right, thanks, Gerhard.